everybody, and welcome back to another edition of the Stars and Stripes Cricket Podcast presented by Dream Cricket. I'm your host, Peter Delapena, and on today's episode, we have part two of the interview with USA Women's Fast Bowling All-Rounder Tara Norris. Part one, Tara talked about her experiences growing up in the Sussex Development System, where she's gone on to play for Loughborough Lightning, Southern Vipers, Southern Brave, but in this episode, we'll be focusing mainly on her experiences with the USA Women's Team, where she made her debut in Mexico last month at the ICC America's Women's T20 World Cup Qualifier, and now she's on the eve of making her ODI debut for the USA Women in the 50 over World Cup Qualifier in Zimbabwe, where USA will start the tournament taking on Bangladesh before continuing in the group stage against Pakistan, Thailand, and the host Zimbabwe. But before we get to part two of the interview with Tar Norris, I want to give a special shout out to the newest Patreon. Arjunan Etier Vieira Singham, former USA Cricket Association board member in the USACA era, who represented the Western Zone on the USACA board. He was based out of Los Angeles at the time, now living in Sri Lanka, and I've seen him travel internationally to support the USA men's team. He's a huge supporter of USA cricket overall, including the women, and I know Arjunan is very excited to follow the fortunes of the women's team, including Tara Norris, as they embark on their ODI World Cup qualifier in Zimbabwe. I appreciate Arjunan's support, and I appreciate everybody else's support who has joined on Patreon. For those who have haven't already done so you can start off for as little as three dollars to support the stars and stripes cricket podcast gets produced i also want to thank our main sponsors for the podcast dream cricket and musa cricket stadium the first and original turf wicket facility in the state of texas for more information call 713-534-2195 that's musa cricket stadium in Pearland, texas now charlotte edwards coach of the vipers coach with the brave england legend international legend and again, somebody who you said you were exposed to fairly early on growing up on the pathway from seeing her as somebody on TV, winning World Cups, doing amazing things as a player to now having her as a coach. What has that experience been like for you? It's been amazing. She She's a fantastic mentor, um, a brilliant coach. And I don't know what, what it is, but she has just got this winning culture about her, which is just infectious. Yeah, she's brilliant to work with. Honestly, I've got to pinch myself whenever I'm at training and she's just down there chatting to me what she's achieved in her career. You know, she's a pioneer for women's cricket. But most importantly, she's such great fun. She is just hilarious and very people first, which, you know, is a massive thing. Not every coach is like that. She's very understanding, very caring and just a lot of fun. So, yeah, to be able to work with her every day is brilliant. Um, and her experience and knowledge, obviously, is is just next to next next level. And she's got some great stories about, you know, her touring life. Yeah, so honestly, playing playing under her is, is such a privilege. I know you've talked in a few other places about how you were contacted to play for USA. Julia Price essentially reached out to you during the summer, towards the end of the summer, and called you up and said, hey, do you have your U.S. passport handy or do you need to renew yeah. it? And are you interested? But one of the things that some people may or may not be aware of, I think some people in the U.S. cricket said it may be aware of, Charlotte Edwards has actually been to the U.S. quite a few times to do has, yeah. some work with a touring MCC squad. She came to Philadelphia. Your Philadelphia roots. She there came. To, she came to play at Marion Cricket Club as part of an MCC tour. The women actually got treated a hell of a lot better than the men did on that MCC tour. There was there were dual tours, and the men the men played in New York City at this ground, Baisley Cage. And true story. On the Saturday night, so they played a, a Saturday and a Sunday, MCC played in New York, and then they were going to Indianapolis to play against a USA national squad in Indianapolis as well. But while they were in New York, they played the Saturday night game at Baisley Pond. The women, the MCC women were playing against the USA squad in Philadelphia the day before, I think, at Germantown on the Saturday and Sunday. They were going to play at Marion. And Marion, for people who don't know, is this very grand facility in a very posh area of Philadelphia. And it's basically white glove service at the pavilion. It's okay. this very old kind of very English style pavilion. And Marion Cricket Club is right across the street from Marion Golf Club, which has actually hosted, I believe, the US Open Golf uh, Championship, one of the four majors. Oh, okay. It was a big deal. And so the women are being treated to this incredible experience playing at Marion Cricket Club. And, and so you have this gorgeous 
perfectly maintained outfield at Marion Cricket Club, which for most of the summer is used for lawn tennis for the members, but they set up a mat for the women to play the cricket on. And then they had this uh, luncheon inside, which was again, white glove service. And that's what the women got the men in New York city, Saturday night at Baisley, which is kind of on, on the border of Queens and Brooklyn. Um, yeah. Overnight, there was, I think a drug deal that went bad and somebody was murdered oh outside, outside Baisley cricket ground. So Sunday, when they came back to play the next day, there was police tape everywhere, oh just on the border of the cricket ground where they were playing. Was that the boundary, right? That was the boundary, essentially, yeah. And uh, the men, when I got to Indianapolis, so the next day, I was in Philadelphia when this was happening. And when I got to Indianapolis to rejoin the MCC men's tour, they said, oh my God, you know, we're so grateful to be in Indianapolis. You wouldn't believe what happened in New York City. Oh my gosh, that's crazy. Uh, But yeah, so anyway, Charlotte Edwards was not exposed to, to that horror experience she's come to the u.s she's played with the mcc tour she she came with claire taylor and there were a bunch of other players yeah. illustrious players just after her in england retirement so she played the usa in that and then i think a year later a year or two later she came to houston and did another week of development coaching and working with the usa national team doing some skills coaching and other work with the usa players so she was aware of obviously what the u.s setup is like a little bit how much communication did you have with Charlotte Edwards about what to expect and how much if anything from whatever discussion you may have had with her influenced your decision to pursue the USA opportunity after Julia Price had had given you that initial phone call yes obviously Price got in touch with Lottie actually and said you know who's this Tara Norris girl um can you get to call me so I kind of said to Lottie I said oh like what do you reckon is this is this a good idea you know, how does it work kind of thing. And she said, look, like, as long as it doesn't affect your England eligibility, you know, go for it. What a great opportunity. So well, that was, that was amazing. Um, both her and our uh, regional director, Adam Carty, were really supportive, really encouraging me to go. And and luckily, you know, they're absolutely fine with being out here at regular contacts and things like that. But um, essentially, yeah, her, you know, opinion matters to me so much. I said, look, you know, should I go for it? And she said, absolutely, go for it. Um, so that was kind of the green light that I needed, really. Obviously, um, I don't want to start in the winter. I have coaching, sorry, being coached by her. Um, but essentially, yeah, our, our October is our month off. So really, I thought, you know what? Yeah, let's do it. Let's get out there. If I can get my passport, amazing. Let's see. Let's see if I can actually get out there. And after, even after that phone call, I wasn't really convinced that I would be here. I'd, I'd be coming out until I was sat on that flight, really, <laughs> at Heathrow Airport. So, yeah, that meant a lot, definitely, to get her support and, and Adam Carty's as well. But did she tell you anything about how the U.S. setup was in terms of women's cricket and in that context, the amount of responsibility you would have to contribute based on what is essentially an amateur setup still in the yeah. U.S.A. for women? Yeah, I don't think we spoke about it much. I think she just said, look, this would be a great opportunity for you. Go out there. It's, it's a good chance to get some some more practice under your belt and to play outdoor as well. And essentially, I'd, be, I'd wanted to go to Australia anyway for winter. It was a very similar setup, basically. But I think she she let me um, figure it out for myself and I don't think she wanted to kind of ruin anything or, or spoil anything, but she just had to let go out there, have a good time. They're a really nice bunch of girls. Um, it's good fun. You'll, you'll absolutely love it. Um, and even now, she just tells me to just make sure I come out with lots of stories and, and fill her in, basically. You said it didn't really hit you until you got on the flight on the way to San Francisco. So let me ask you this, both now and in previous interviews, you made it clear England is where your ambitions lie you want that's that's the end goal that's this would be the highest form of cricket you could possibly play is playing for England and coming to the U.S. is a different opportunity so in in terms of trying to balance your England ambitions and people knowing that that is the goal and there's nothing wrong with that but then going into a different international setup where it's not your dream or your number one target but you're still trying to achieve something and trying to contribute what was it like coming into the setup and being around the girls, having the kind of competing goals and ambitions entering the U.S. setup? Yeah. Um, firstly, yeah, meeting all the girls was, was brilliant. I guess the, the different, well, nothing really changed for me. I, I still felt like I had to prove myself. I think that's the case with any team, any te- new team you walk into. Obviously, I, I didn't know anyone. For me, yeah, I wanted to prove myself and and show that I'd, I'd earned a spot on the team. The last thing I wanted to do was take someone's spot who obviously... Um, had been involved in the nationals or a, a young a young girl who obviously had aspirations so for me I wanted to make sure that I, I did a good job 
and I don't match up the team in terms of obviously it was it's very different to what I've played it's you know coming from the 100 playing against the likes of ridiculous internationals it, it was different but it was a different challenge and it's an opportunity for me to to prove myself as a player and and come against different challenges and play against different players different conditions which again is only going to develop my cricket and exposing yourself in, in new challenges is is always good you know it's easy to play it safe but for me this was you know a completely new experience I'm still learning from them hopefully I'm, I'm teaching them a few things as well and, and it's a two-way kind of thing but yeah for me there was the expectation really was to to not drop any standards and you know to work my butt off and and earn myself a place in that squad. How did the experience during it and after it concluded change your opinions if any opinion you had beforehand of what cricket with the USA national team would be about? Yeah going in I, I made sure I didn't have any expectation or any expectations of the standard. I wanted to walk into it completely kind of open-minded and so it was like once I got there and yeah the first tour was brilliant. I absolutely loved it and the, the talent in the squad is just ridiculous. There's 16 year old girls hit a ball like I've never seen it. So it's a really exciting group to be involved with and I'm you know really excited to be in the squad as well um, and watch the team grow and, and hopefully be a part of some really cool tournaments to come up. Um, in terms of sort of England stuff you know I have no idea which journey I'm going to be involved in or where my cricket's going to take me individually. But, you know, right now, my my goal is to do what, you know, my job for USA right now. And then when I go back to the UK, it'll be the same to the Vipers and kind of so forth. But yeah, for now, it's 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 USA and I'm, I'm trying to do the best job I can, really. A couple of things I want to touch on there. One about the standard of play and two, some of the references you made to the teenagers and the quality of your teammates. For people who aren't unaware, when you were part of the England Academy team or England developmental squad, you were exposed to associate cricket then. So this technically was not your first experience in associate cricket. In 2014, you actually played in a tournament, the Europe qualifier, where an England developmental squad was put in there against the likes of Netherlands, Ireland, et cetera. So you had a little bit of a sense of what associate yeah. cricket was about. How, if you can remember seven years ago, back to that experience compared to this experience in Mexico, how have the standards of associate cricket changed in your eyes if you can compare the two experiences yeah playing I think we played Midland like you said I remember the age I was yeah probably 16 at the time or so thinking yeah this is it was like playing almost county cricket really and uh, not thinking anything different and obviously kind of yeah as, as you get older and play with different players and the likes of Gabby Lewis and I know the the, the, the Bryce sisters really well I just I guess sort of from speaking to them and stuff and, and hearing about the standards and the cricket yeah, again, I, I wasn't really sure what the standard would be like or or in terms of the whole setup and, and how it's going to work. But yeah, the Mexico was was definitely a completely new experience I've, I've been involved with and seen. I think playing against Brazil was honestly one of the best experiences I've ever had. Just playing against a team with so much energy and the fact that they're fully contract as well is brilliant. So in terms of that, I think, yeah, it's, any, it's, it's brilliant. And, you know, obviously it's a little bit behind. That's expected when there isn't a lot of funding or a lot of support behind the teams. But the fact that they've got a team out and they're coming to play and they love the game is is amazing to see. So, you know, with a little bit of funding, a little bit of support and guidance, you know, it's really encouraging to see where where that country's game could go, especially as it's not their country's first sport. Um, that was probably the main thing that I was just in awe of, really. Have you caught the Allegria fever? The Allegria fever, yeah, it's it's there. It's embedded. I caught a lot out in Mexico, a lot of stomach bugs, but I also caught the Allegria, the Allegria bug. No, you were quite popular, actually, with the Brazilian players. Everybody, I was looking, they wanted your autograph. They wanted selfies with you. <laughs> I don't know why, honestly. I said you really don't want it. Was, so it, was, your, the photo. was it your tambourine skills? Because you look pretty sharp. It must have been that. It must have been that, yeah. Honestly, the first game I watched, I said, that tambourine is so annoying. Like, can they stop doing that? And then by the last game I was there, it was in my hand. I couldn't, I couldn't resist. It was quite a unique experience being around the Brazilian players in particular. They just brought so much fantastic energy that... Yeah, they were brilliant. Even the, the biggest cricket Grinch had to have their opinion changed by the end of the tour if they were there. They were brilliant. They, had, they were so much fun. When you made your USA debut, of all the people who reached out to you or, or you weren't expecting to hear from or people who might have come out of the woodwork, come out of the boo, who saw or heard about you playing for USA and making your international debut, what was the most surprising and the most meaningful message you got, whether it was a WhatsApp or a text or a phone call when the call-up happened when you made your debut? I, just, you know, I had a lot of really lovely messages from family, friends, everyone. People saying they'd watched the game, probably from my parents, my dad. My dad's my biggest fan. Um, he just messaged me the night before 
this UK time in the morning and just said like I'm, I'm so proud of you I wish I could be there you know you've worked really hard for this just go out and enjoy and absolutely no pressure at all kind of thing but um it probably only really hit me and I was quite emotional kind of when we're doing the national anthem and just thinking oh my gosh I've, I've made it like I'm here I'm in Mexico City I'm about to play my first international game you know what on earth is going on something which I, I didn't think was going to happen or was even possible of happening so just kind of that moment after caps you know it's quite emotional watching the other girls as well and obviously that was a big part of their journey um so to be involved in that yeah well, the whole day was was pretty special but definitely that national anthem moment kind of really hit home and obviously yeah I wish my parents and family could have been there but obviously it's a very difficult circumstances but yeah that was that was very memorable for sure and just to follow up to that you mentioned the national anthem and the cap ceremony what was that experience like for you again as it's starting to hit you and it's sinking in like oh my god I'm making my international debut and having Julia Price and everybody else part of the team being part of that ceremony take us through that experience what was it like and then I guess leading into the first ball you were about to bowl on international cricket and then striking on your second ball in international cricket to take your first wicket yeah obviously I hadn't been in that group for that long I'd probably mix with them about a week prior so again it was like oh you know having getting your cap a cap ceremony is very emotional and and really sentimental anyway um but obviously you know, I'm in a group who I don't really know that well I feel like you don't really know your group until you play with them properly so yeah so Uzi gave me my cap who obviously was probably the closest player that I've got to in this comp um just a really great girl um lots of good fun so yeah that was just the words that she said especially for not knowing me that long were very personal and very meaningful definitely and yeah I remember when the ball when I was given actually I was really ill the first game as well the whole week everyone was ill basically I remember having the cold sweats thinking oh my gosh I've got to play a game <laughs> um and just feeling so ill but um I remember when the ball was given to me I thought right okay here we go you know let's go for it let's do it let's take the handbrake off and just throw yourself out this basically yeah I think the first ball was all right actually and then yeah second ball pin on the pads and I thought that's definitely out and that was yeah very special and to have a team celebrate your success when they've only just met you as well is very very special you know these guys didn't really know me I hadn't really gelled into the team yet but to see their success and happiness for me for that second ball was it was yeah amazing there's a new wave of talent coming into the US team wasn't there before prior to you coming on you came around right at the right time Tara because 10 years ago the team was experienced not always in a good way there, there were there were a couple of 50 year olds in the team there were quite a number of 40 year olds in the team it was an unfit team and a poorly conditioned team unathletic poor fielding so many basic standards that just weren't being met that especially on, on the associate level if batting and bowling isn't there, you can understand the skill wise, but at the very least, as a lot of people got to see on the web stream, Brazil, you take the example of Brazil, at the very least, you got to have athletes, you got to have people who are conditioned, fit and can field to at least close the gap in an area that can be controlled if you don't have the exposure to top quality batting and bowling. USA didn't have that. It's a different story now in 2021. And whether it's you or some of the other Debbie Dons, the teenagers, Coming from the setup that you had developmentally in Sussex and then in your first touring experience, seeing some of the players that USA has now, whether it's Aniku Kalan or Suhani Tadani or Gargi Bogli or, or your roommate on tour, Lassia Malapudi. My roommate. These teenagers, they're very exciting to watch. As somebody who's an outside observer, I can't remember seeing this at any form of cricket for the US, men or women. And to see this coming along all at once, it's a hugely motivational thing in terms of the development pathway and the structure and what the future of USA cricket should be about. And seeing the way some of these players performed throughout the week, whether it was Suhani Tadani with the ball or especially Gargi Bogley with the bat or Aniku Kalan with the bat, some of the other players, what stands out to you about some of these teenagers and how do they compare realistically with the players at an equivalent stage age-wise in a Sussex or an England pathway? Personally, I don't think it was anything to do with me. Um, when I walked into that squad, the culture was there, I think. You know, there was that drive. There was that that eager-to-learn kind of culture. I remember the first training session. I was quite ill when I first got here. So after a week of recovery, my first training session for a camp in Dallas, we'd done some scenarios. It was my first bowling session back. And after we had a little debrief and we gave some feedback, and my feedback was very kind of pretty neutral. Um, didn't want to say anything too outrageous. Kept it quite neutral, gave some some criticism, some bit of feedback and, and some positives, whatever. 
And then these girls just gave the feedback to me and to other players. And it was so honest and ruthless and brutal, actually. And I was like, wow, these kids are very aware. Like, they were so pedantic about their own game, my game, other players. I was like, oh, my gosh, I don't think I've ever been in a scenario where someone has told it straight to my face like that. Um, it was amazing. It was so refreshing. You know, even now, players that I play with now are like, oh, I don't want to say, I don't want to give feedback. But whether that's a US culture, I don't know. Maybe that's an English thing. I'm a little bit too shy. But I think, yeah, the girls have got a lot of confidence. But it's, you know, it's not arrogance. It's confidence in speaking in their own game, which is something, again, I, I coach back in the UK. And it's something which I'm trying to get girls just to have more confidence in their ability. But these girls definitely aren't shy of that. And it's, yeah, it's so refreshing to see. And in that sense, that's there's a massive difference. They're extremely mature for their age in terms of their awareness as a person, as a cricketer what they need to work on, what their ambitions are. So when, when I speak to them, I really don't feel like I'm speaking to 16 year olds. I feel like I'm speaking to, you know, players that are my age. In terms of the things that you're exposed to and that you experience on a day-to-day -day basis, whether it was with the Vipers or the Brave or any other part of the professional setup, what are the biggest areas that you think some of the U.S. players, whether it's male or female, especially at kind of that junior 15 and 19 year old developmental stage need to work on to try and close the gap with their counterparts, whether it's in England or any other test nation? Um, I'd probably say it's probably nothing to do with skill-wise. I think the skill will always catch up. You can always coach a cricket skill. Um, it's probably the character and attitude, um, which probably a standout. I want, you know, you want to see players with a good attitude and, and a good work ethic. I think for a lot of young players, it's really easy to just focus on skills, but to not even look at kind of the S&C point of view, um, which is pretty normal and pretty natural. And, Again, I was exactly the same. I just wanted to play cricket. Why is lifting weights going to be a big thing? Why, why do I need to run? I'm just going to play cricket and bowl. So I guess, you know, that's something which I think is pretty common throughout a lot of kids that age. And yeah, not neglecting, unfortunately, the boring side of cricket, the, the, the tactical bit, the S&C point of view, the nutrition, and I guess just sort of that professionalism, uh, timekeeping, and especially as a kid, you're balancing schoolwork as well. So if, you know, they can balance, balance their social life, their schoolwork and their cricket, um, I'm sure they're doing a pretty good job of it already but yeah I think that'll only help them grow and again it's that ownership something which you know I didn't expose to after being dropped from from a setup if you can find that grit and that motivation and that ownership to really take hold of your game then yeah I'm sure they'll all flourish into you know unbelievable cricketers. Today's episode of the Stars and Stripes Cricket Podcast presented by Dream Cricket is also sponsored by Musa Cricket Stadium, the first and original turf wicket facility in the state of Texas, and now one of the premier venues for the minor league cricket T20 franchise tournament. Located at 5515 McKeever Road in Perryland, five miles off the Bailey Road exit from State Route 288 and a half hour south of downtown Houston, Musa Cricket Stadium includes fully enclosed locker rooms and change rooms plus shower facilities after day's play, as well as outdoor nets for all your training needs. For more information, call 713-534-2195. That's Musa Cricket Stadium in Pearland, Texas. What's the number one thing that you feel you've brought to the U.S. women's setup that makes them better than they would be without you? Apart from my taste in music, the team playlist has definitely improved. They'll definitely disagree with that, but I'm not sure. You know, I don't think, I think maybe my energy. For me, this is just an amazing experience. So I'm just enjoying every minute. So I hope on the pitch and off the pitch, I'm bringing a lot of energy and lightheartedness and you know, they're all 16. A lot of them take their cricket quite seriously. Um, so I've said to a few of them, look, you're 16 years old. You know, you're in Mexico City. Just take a deep breath, relax, trust yourself. When you go and play, you'll be absolutely fine. Which is probably something which, again, when I was that age, even now, I can be quite intense and, and take it all quite seriously. And sometimes you need someone to say, look, just smile, just relax, enjoy it. You know, what, what an opportunity. Um, so hopefully I can bring a little bit of that. Hopefully I have. You know, nothing cricket-wise at all, I don't think. But just kind of being around the team, um, hopefully, yeah, they've enjoyed that. Taking a, a light-hearted view of things, not taking things so seriously, is something that I think is a fantastic area to point out because I've seen that a lot in junior players. They've got this almost life-and-death attitude towards cricket. That so they, much pressure. They get they've so wound so up. They get so much pressure themselves. Yeah. 100%. And especially a lot of kids and their parents, they just do cricket, 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 cricket 24-7. Going back to the point you made earlier about playing tennis growing up, I grew up in a family where in the neighborhood, you played sports by season. So in the neighborhood, it was in the winters, we played street hockey. And in the yeah. spring and summer, you would play football, th throwing around American football in the backyard. Yeah, yeah. 
And then in the summers, you played baseball too. And it, you developed a lot of skills. And we played tennis too. We played tennis, as I mentioned, for a while growing up. But it was about fun, first off, and getting a chance to experience and play different sports and develop different skills and all the hand-eye coordination and all that. Not that we were thinking yeah, about Yeah, yeah, same here. But same having fun, it was the camaraderie of playing these other team games and team sports, but also just avoiding burnout. I, I could not fathom if I had to grow up and I just played one sport nonstop, seven days a week, 24-7. I would just get sick and tired of it. Yeah, and, yeah. and I no, see I, that. I I witness it sometimes in, in the kids in the um, U.S. academies, these private academies in the U.S., where I ask the parents, boys and girls, you know, what other sports do you play? Why would we play any other sport? We're focused on cricket. No, like, I don't think that's the positive you're thinking it is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, and, and research shows that as well, you know, like I'm using my, I'm using my degree now. Um, you know, research shows playing loads of sports as a kid, it's, it's all, it all transfers, you know, and then essentially, you know, I only really played cricket that on its own at the age of maybe 13 14 so even that I think is quite young but yeah why would you not expose yourself to all these different sports because those are the better athletes those are the better movers in the field and you can see it as well um so yeah no I couldn't agree more and I see that a little bit with a player like in particular such as Giti Kadali and I know she's somebody who played a lot of tennis I don't know if she still does but she played a significant amount of tennis growing up when I uh, did a podcast episode with her she talked about I I played a whole lot of other sports and I I just gave cricket a try because I thought it was something I would just try once. I just wanted to make my dad happy for once. <laughs> Playing a sport my dad would enjoy too. I wish she's stuck. And it's like, oh, it's stuck. I had fun with it. But she came to cricket after she had played so many other things. And it wasn't something that she was forced yeah. into. It was forced fed to her. She did it willingly yeah. in addition to playing all these other sports. And I think that's it's an overlooked thing. It's, it's so important. I think it's a great point you bring up. Now, the other part of this I want to segue into quick before we get to the, the favorite 11. One other question. In terms of having fun, not taking things so seriously. Now, after the fact, we can look on this a little bit lighthearted. But at the time, the fifth match against Canada with the obstructing the field that wasn't called against Divya Saxena, it was no laughing matter at the time. USA wound up losing the game by seven runs. You didn't play that day. I you were on the, on the bench. You were not feeling well. I wish I was. I wish <laughs> I was playing that game. So you had to sit out. You had to – and it's obviously – a lot harder sitting out where you can have an impact on the field. But looking after the fact, I tweeted the video out and it's gone viral. It's got over 300,000 views. And part of it is because people just think it's so hilarious that it was given not out. Uh, so you've got like a very small percentage of people who are like indign indignant with outrage. How dare she do that? How dare she give it not out? What is the umpire doing? And the rest of the people think it's the funniest thing they've ever seen. So <laughs> looking back now, having won the tournament and knowing that it didn't impact USA's advancement and qualification, do you see the funny side of that incident? Are you, or are you and the other teammates still stewing about Divya Saxena and, and the nefarious actions she took to obstruct your teammates from catching yeah. the ball? Yeah, gosh. Yeah, like you said, I wasn't playing that game. I was, I was really unwell, actually. But even on the sideline, I remember thinking, has she just ran into that? And obviously, I was, a complete, I was stood obviously a completely different angle. So I didn't realize how bad it was until I saw the video um, a bit later. And yeah, like what she did was, I don't agree with I'm not sure why I wasn't dealt with on the pitch if I was playing I probably would have said a few words I'm sure I think mostly for us at the back it was about trying to be respectful I think the umpires had a conversation but yeah look I, I don't agree with what happened and it probably should have been dealt with much better hopefully that's a learning curve I guess for the comp um but since then I think it has been an apology I think as, as the girls that we won the comp you know it did cost us the game but cricket works in funny ways there could have been a different moment it could have been something else it could have been one of our players, but I think there has been an apology. And for us, look, if that ever happens again, hopefully we deal with it in a slightly different way. Yeah, I mean, it is pretty hilarious what happened. At the time, it, it wasn't. It was probably, I'm sure, very frustrating on that pitch. But yeah, God, <laughs> hopefully that doesn't happen in Zimbabwe. Otherwise, yeah, I'm not sure what we'll do. One of the things you brought up there too, the angle. So where the USA bench was when that incident happened, you would have been at like deep backward point, kind of deep third man on an yeah. angle. I was in the, is she running towards me? Yeah, well, I was in the broadcast booth with Andrew Leonard at the time, and we were essentially at the cover boundary, maybe right, okay. 30, 50 yards wider than you were. And it looked a little unusual, but square on. Yeah. Like, it didn't seem so obvious. And it was only after the fact. And we didn't, our production TV wasn't working at the time, so we didn't get an immediate replay. Right, we okay. were not aware in the moment. Of I how, was running that, actually. Yeah, we, we had no idea in the moment how blatant it was. And it wasn't until day later that night or the next day that I saw 
footage of the video and i was like oh my god how on earth was did this happen how was how did she get away with this and first i was like you know oh my god like how how was she giving that out and it was almost like this is so bizarre and, and then we were kind of looking at like starting to laugh like at the absurdity of not only how crazy was this that she did this but how crazy was that that she got away with it yeah <laughs> i know she should have been the, the player of the match i think that game um yeah, like it wasn't pretty. It wasn't the best uh, moment for, for women's cricket or for cricket. But I think it's been dealt with now. <laughs> yeah, there was quite a lot of frustration in the group for that. Um, and I think obviously because we lost as well, it, it probably hurt even more. But realistically, we didn't play well that game. So regardless what happened, I don't think that impact was solely because of that. I don't think the result was solely because of that. You know, we didn't play brilliant that game anyway. But yeah, bizarre, very bizarre. <laughs> Just when you think you've seen it all. Something like that happened. <laughs> One other question before we get to the favorite 11, just in terms of looking forward to the qualifier in Zimbabwe and beyond for U.S. cricket, I'm always curious to ask players in terms of goals, they said, obviously it's, it's a big up, uphill battle, but are you somebody who sets personal goals in terms of wickets and runs and things to motivate you in terms of how you want to perform over and above? Obviously the team goal is we want to win every game. We want to go out there and win. But some players set these targets to kind of motivate themselves to achieve things that will in the bigger picture benefit the team aside from themselves personally and other players they just go out and they play and however they play on the days that's all they think about focusing on the next ball bold how, however cliche that is are you somebody who sets targets for yourself big picture as a source of motivation or are you somebody who just you're just thinking about the next ball and that's that yeah probably a little bit of both I love setting goals I'm quite a big I'm very like goal ambitious anyway but I know if I get a little bit too caught up in the goals, it, sometimes I just worry about that rather than doing what I need to do for this game, for this ball, etc. So a little bit of both. Obviously, I you know I want to go in as as a senior player, as a senior bowler for the USA team. And my expectation, yeah, it, I do want to do well. Obviously, I want to take wickets. For me as well, I, I want to be able to score some runs for the team as well. I didn't really do that in Mexico, um, which was very frustrating and a goal of mine which I'd set previously um, to have at least you know one one decent knock, which would have been nice. So yeah, going into this, 50 over as well, I, I much prefer 50 over. It's much more bowler friendly. My domestic case always quite bowler friendly anyway <laughs> from the wicket. But um, yeah, hopefully, yeah, I have got goals in mind. I, I want to take a lot of wickets. In terms of number, you know, I'm not worried about, I must hit X amount of wickets, X amount of runs, X amount of catches, whatever. But yeah, I, I'm expecting, I, I have high expectations that I want to be a senior player and I want to be a key player for the team um, with the bat and the ball. So yeah, the hunger is there. It's certainly not going to be a light trip. We're going to be challenged and we're going to play against good teams, but also that's a really good opportunity for players like myself and other senior players and even younger players to step up. Whether it's a short-term goal in this tournament or a long-term goal besides England, we know England is, is the overarching ambition, but if and when that comes, it may never come. It may come very soon or, like I said, it may never come. In terms of short-term goal for USA and a long-term goal for USA, if you thought that far ahead, what are things that you want to achieve at this tournament for USA and big picture in the next couple of tournaments in the next few years that you feel you can contribute to make USA achieve a, a certain goal or, or big picture target? Yeah, I think right now, obviously, qualifying for the World Cup would be just out of this world. I don't know how realistic that is. Um, I know, again, we are going to be the underdogs, but I know if we play to at least 90% of our potential, we're going to give it a, a really good go. Um, and I think we're going to shock quite a few teams. So I guess short term, obviously, the goal is New Zealand 2022, um, 100%. And then I guess long term, I know the Olympics are coming up soon, which would be amazing if I was still involved. And I guess just trying to get that ranking, that ICC ranking, um, as high as we can and to be involved in these major tournaments. And hopefully, you know, hopefully I'll be a, a memorable player for USA. You know, I want to do a good job for this team and and leave in a good place as well. Like you said, you know, England days might never come. Who knows? I'm, I'm really enjoying what I'm doing right now. So yeah, hopefully the, the imprint I make, the impact I have on USA is, is really memorable. Um, so I suppose, yeah, long term, it would be to, to be a part of some amazing US journey. Not to be cliche, but yeah, be part of some ridiculous journey with them. Favorite 11 time, Tara Norris. Okay. Rapid fire 11 questions. You know how it works. So... Ready. Before we get to that, I just want to remind everybody that the Stars and Stripes Cricket Podcast is presented by Dream Cricket. Dream Cricket Pavilion Shop can help you fill all your cricket kit requirements from top-of-the-line English willow bats 
made by all the top manufacturers, as well as helmets, gloves, pads, jerseys, highlight DVDs, books, and more. Get 10% off all orders over $400 using coupon code DCUSA. That's DCUSA. Go to shop.dreamcricket.com to take advantage of that offer today. Dream Cricket Academy is located at 400 Apgar Drive in Somerset, New Jersey, just a mile off of Exit 12 on Interstate 287. For more information, call 908-938-3787 or email cricket at dreamcricket.com. Tar Norris, favorite 11 time. Ready to rock and roll. Yeah. Don't mind you sending me mug, by the way. It's my new souvenir. Yosemite Park. Oh, yeah. Get to that. It's happened. Sorry. Right. Yeah, I'm ready. Let's do it. Your favorite roommate on any cricket tour? It's got to be Sophia Dunkley for sure. She's good fun. I've roomed with her since we were probably age of 14, 15. Various tours abroad and in the UK. So, yeah, hands down. And she makes me coffee every morning. So, what's not to like? Your favorite way now, you're getting to be a bit more experienced in this. You just had the long haul flight from London to San Francisco. You've you've gone to Australia. What is your favorite way to pass the time on a 10, 12, 14 hour long haul flight? I normally just stick a film on or it depends who's next to me. I could be someone's worst nightmare and chew their ear off and just chat the entire way. But actually recently I um I've got a Rubik's Cube and I made a bet with one of the players that I don't think I can complete it before the end of Zimbabwe. So actually, for our next flight, I'll be doing a Rubik's Cube for 30 hours trying to trying to figure it out and win this bet. So yeah, that's that's probably my new one. Your favorite city or country that you have toured for cricket? Cape Town. Hands down. Amazing. Amazing, amazing place. Why is it amazing? The grounds were just beautiful. Uh, you've got Table Mountain pretty much in every background. Um, the steaks are amazing. They're cheap. The culture, the people are wonderful. The weather, the lot. I, I could be here all day. Now, we might be going back to the well to the previous answer this, but I always ask this for everybody your favorite cricket ground experience that you've had as a player or as a fan? Yeah, it, it's got to be Lord's 100 final for sure. I don't think I'll ever experience anything like that. I hope I do, but I don't think I will. And yeah, the Lord's teas are famous for, I think I had like roast lamb. The teas, honestly, it's like gourmet five-star dining, which is much better than a sausage roll and a slice of pizza at most clubs you'll get. <laughs> so, yeah, Lords, definitely. Your favourite cricketer of all time? Uh, male or female? That's up to you. Oh, can I do both? Go right ahead. Okay, all time. Got to be asked to cook. Love watching him bat. He only had two shots, but he was an amazing cricketer. Left-handed as well, loved watching him bat. And just his style was really cool and brilliant captain. And female, it's got to be Charlotte Edwards. Your favorite non cricket athlete of all time? I think I'm going to sit with the tennis theme, and it's got to be Serena Williams. Um, mind you, Emma Raducani might be might be a close second, but yeah, I just think she's a, a phenomenal athlete. Your favorite place to eat out on tour? Unfortunately, Mexico won't make it, considering the amount of gut issues that were involved. I'm um, shocked. I'm shocked eaters. at you, Tara. I yeah, uh, it probably hasn't made my top ten actually. It, there's a place in South Africa called, there's a chain called Beef Boys and it's a steakhouse and it's just amazing. I think every night on tour, went to Potchestroom and we'd pretty much went there every night of tour and it's just the most incredible steaks you've ever had. I don't know, it probably cost about four or five pounds for a T-bone the size of your head pretty much. Yeah, Beef Boys, definitely. I can vouch for this because when the US men went- Have you been? The Pachistrum, yeah. So U.S. men went to Uganda in May 2017. And before Uganda for World Cricket League Division Three, they had a warm-up tour in Pachistrum. And we went to Beef Boys. And yes, so you know. You get the, like, what doesn't matter, filet mignon, sirloin, T-bone, porthouse, whatever. Yeah. Biggest, juiciest cuts for literally bargain basement prices. Beef yeah, beef. pennies. <laughs> the supply and demand there, it's very favorable if you're into your steaks. <laughs> it is. It's a great place at all. It's a great place. That would be one of my top of the list reasons for going back to South Africa is just so I can go yeah. back to the boys. The steak. Tara, are you a Coke or a Pepsi person? If I had to pick, it'd probably be like a Diet Coke, but I'm not a massive fizzy drinks person. You're not into the high fructose corn syrup? Yeah, no, I'm an athlete. My body's a temple. I can't be drinking that. I don't, if I had to, a Diet Coke or a Coke Zero. I wouldn't have Coke, a full fat Coke. Though. Coke products are the acceptable answer. Okay, okay. Then, yeah, Coke. If you said Pepsi, we wouldn't get to questions 9, 10, and 11. I'd have to cut this short. <laughs> okay, that's all right. 
Your favorite pizza topping? Obviously being Italian as well, I like my pizza simple. Less is more, definitely. I'm sure you can relate. Favorite topping, a bit of rocket. Very simple pizza, but a nice splash of some fresh rocket on top is always is always a go-to. Maybe a little bit of olive oil as well. Is this a, a Mama Paola recommendation or is this on your own? You've you've acquired this rocket. Yeah, and... no, my mom was never a big, never a big pizza maker, but yeah, just from going out and going to Italy. Simple as best. It's kind of a follow-up 9A question. Where is the best pizza you've ever had in your life? I've got to say Naples. Not to name drop, but it's got to be Naples. Just the thinnest, the best pizza. Mind you, when I went to New York, I had quite a good pizza, but it was nothing like a Naples pizza. I have not been to Naples yet, but yes, the reputation there is almost... You've got to. Second to none. It would be rude, it would be rude not to. But I am yeah. partial. As somebody who grew up in northern New Jersey, I, I am partial to the to the New York, New Jersey pizza. It's not the same. It's nowhere near the same. But but at least you go to you go to the hometown place. You go to the you go to the local place. I've never yeah, been okay. in my entire life in New York, New Jersey. First time I ever went to a Domino's was outside of New York, New Jersey. You cannot find anything remotely close to being a chain restaurant in in most of New York, New Jersey. It's it's yeah. the mom and pop places, hundred percent. Really? Oh wow. And that's something, I don't know if it's like this in Sussex, but in Manchester, it's very difficult to find a quality pizza. I won't eat pizza in the UK, essentially. I, w- I wait until I go to the US for work and family to get oh, really? pizza. So I'll go months and months. Okay, well, London London has some really good spots, actually, but I'm the same. I hate going out for Italian food because I'm I'm always disappointed. But um, yeah. yeah, London's got some really good spots, actually. Your favorite movie of all time? Pretty Woman. It's a classic. It's really basic, but Pretty Woman. Last but not least, your favorite show to binge watch, whether it's Netflix, Amazon Prime, or Hulu, anything else, DVD box set. Uh, when, you're, when you're in quarantine in Mexico or when, or when you're in quarantine in Zimbabwe ahead of the matches and you've got all sorts of time to pass, what is your go-to to help get you through all those hours? I'm not a massive like series binger, but right now I am watching you, so some I don't know some kind of like rom-com I don't know thriller that kind of vibe not you obviously but um yeah if I had to that's what I'm watching right now but who knows in Zimbabwe I'm normally too tired I can't even stay awake to watch something how bad is that the reason why I'm laughing is because I kid you not my wife she was counting down the days until you season three dropped on Netflix she was desperate yeah. to watch it <laughs> and so as soon as it <laughs> became available that was what we turned on my wife was like we're watching you season three this is too good to miss <laughs> it's so good and you know it, it, when it came out that's when we were in quarantine so I thought perfect I can just watch this great all right Taryn Norris thank you so much for coming on the Stars and Stripes Cricket Podcast I'll give you the final word anything Tara that you want people to know about cricket or about you and your cricket journey that they don't already know that you want to share with the world make sure you watch the the USA play in Zimbabwe Hopefully it'll be an exciting tournament and we'll, we'll shock a few places, a few people as well. And yeah, and please support the USA, USA Women's Cricket and the Vipers as well. Don't forget the Vipers. Don't forget the Palm Bears and the Brave. Yeah, and the Palm Bears, yeah. Again, for people who haven't been following the USA Women's team just coming out of Mexico, as Tara said, they're going to be competing in the Women's 50 Over World Cup qualifier in Zimbabwe that starts on November 21st. And USA's first match is actually... November the 23rd, and that continues into the first week of December. But Tara Norris, fast bowler, fast bowling all-rounder. Not sure what you prefer to go as, but key member of the USA Women's. No, all-rounder sounds good. All-rounder. Oh, you're not going to turn that down. Who would turn that down? <laughs> Left arm fast bowling all-rounder. Tara Norris, thank you so much for coming on. Thank you so much. And good luck in Zimbabwe. Thank you very, very much. That was one of the most fun interviews I've done in the history of the Stars and Stripes Cricket Podcast, dating back to our first episode in May of 2021. Tara is such a fun and engaging person, and she's a fun personality around the USA women's team. It has helped add so much to that squad, both on and off the field, and she'll be competing for USA women starting on Tuesday, November 23rd against Bangladesh in the Women's World Cup Qual. 
qualifier USA again will also be taking on Pakistan, Thailand, and Zimbabwe as they attempt to qualify for their first 50 over World Cup. I want to remind everybody that you can subscribe to the podcast to get each new episode as it lands by going to YouTube and clicking subscribe and also or also subscribing and giving a review and a rating on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, Anchor FM, and many other podcasting platforms. That's it for this episode. I'm Peter Delapena. I want to wish everybody out there around America and any other American citizens around the world a very, very happy Thanksgiving. I know I'm looking forward to it with my own family, and I hope you all have a great Thanksgiving as well. God bless America, and God bless American cricket. Thank you.